The patrons have spoken, and this time they want Gudra. This pseudo legendary dragon from Generation 6 has a design fitting its native region, as it's based on Lou Carcol, a mythical serpent from French folklore. Gen 6's Kalos region, of course, being based on France. Its inspiration doesn't end there either. It's also based on the Blue Dragon Sea Slug and a mythical Japanese entity. A trumpet shell snail which lives for a thousand years in the mountains, another thousand on the plains, another thousand at sea, and will then turn into a dragon. Gudra's evolution method is also quite unique. It needs to level up while it is rainy or foggy in the overworld. This was seen in the anime where Ash's Sligu used Rain Dance to trigger its evolution. Finally, in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Gudra was revealed to have a Hisuian form, which is half dragon, half steel. It hasn't been released in the mainline games at the time of this video, but it's an exciting prospect. Today, we'll be going over Gudra's history in the competitive scene. As a slug, it has much to fear with the salt that goes with the territory, but as a dragon, it could potentially be part of the scene's long-standing traditions of immense power. And so, we ask, how good was Gudra actually? But before we go over these classic mons, we want to tell you about this classic game, because this video is sponsored by Galaga Wars Plus. You remember Galaga, right? Who doesn't? Well, the 1983 classic arcade game has gotten a mobile game upgrade. For those who don't remember Galaga, Galaga is a retro shooter arcade game where you shoot endless waves of enemies to try to get the highest score possible. You can get power-ups to make your weapons really crazy and start vaporizing those space bugs. In fact, I've enjoyed the increased fire rate power-up so much that I put literally all of my coins into increasing the fire rate. There are other power-ups that are helpful too, like the raw shield and the missile barrage. Also, now instead of one ship, you can unlock a bunch bunch of them from pixel ships to more refined ones. There's a ship from various versions of Galaga, and there's even Pac-Man and the Katamari guy. You can upgrade the power-ups for all of them, and for every ship you get, you get more lives. And if you want to support the channel and help us produce more content, you can click the link in the description below and download Galaga Wars Plus to play it like me by using the one-month free trial of Apple Arcade. And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Gudra had an interesting niche in early XYOU. It primarily utilized the defensive rather than offensive properties of the dragon type, with its set of immensely valuable resistances that paired beautifully with its enormous special bulk, allowing it to withstand onslaughts from several of the most terrifying Pokemon, which threatened to overwhelm the rest of the tier. It wasn't a passive blob either. With solid special attack and fantastic super effective coverage, Gudra had no problem striking back forcefully at the Pokemon it was tasked with taking on. Its go-to set was the Assault Vest variant, skyrocketing its special defense to absurd levels, making it an especially good hit taker in conjunction with its great base 90 HP. And in Ultimate, Gudra didn't necessarily have to resist a special attack to take it well. Sure, taking on Mega Charizard Y's Sun Boosted Fire Blast and Keldeo Specs Hydro Pumps was all well and good and Gudra's primary function, but it also took several other incredibly strong hits quite decently, like Landorus Incarnate's Tear Shattering Life Orb and Sheer Force Boosted Earth Power. Even two super effective Stab Greninja Protean and life or boosted ice beams wouldn't take it out. Finally, to truly illustrate the ridiculous extent of Gudra's special bulk, consider how Mega Gardevoir's ferocious, super effective, pixelate boosted hyper voice didn't hit Gudra for too much more than half its health, and even life orb Latios Draco Meteor didn't even come close to KOing it, even after Stealth Rock. Now, you wouldn't exactly want Gudra taking that hit most of the time anyway. The Latios user usually wouldn't be keen on losing their key Pokemon in that one on one matchup either, so Gudra could very well stay in and either attack the switch in with its diverse array of coverage options, or get the KO on Latios if it stayed in. However, the majority of Gudra's value lay in its ability to repeatedly take the monstrously aforementioned special attacks that cut through most of the rest of OU like butter. This hit-taking ability was immensely valuable in bringing stability to slower-paced balance teams desperately in need of refuge against the off-volatile nature of the fast-paced, hard-hitting X and Y metagame, especially since it was quite adept at naturally posing a threat in return. Of course, Gudra had no way of healing itself, which is a significant impediment for a Pokemon whose niche is predicated on its hit-taking ability. Except now, but that was no problem at all for the balanced teams it was placed on, since they were anchored in large part by Alomomola, famous for effortlessly keeping its entire team healthy by passing its teammates enormous wishes. Gujar was especially apt at receiving such wishes, since it switched in so effortlessly against the electric and grass-type attacks aimed at Alomomola. It was outright immune to grass, actually, thanks to its sap-sipper ability. This gave it the even rarer, absolutely excellent trait of being 
completely unbothered by Ferrothorn's famously obnoxious leech seed. Gujar's niche was more or less restricted entirely to balance teams. It wasn't quite hard hitting enough to see consistent use on offense, and it didn't pack the longevity to be part of a stall core. However, when it came to filling out the needs of the Aloma Mola balance style that dominated the X and Y metagame, Gujar was outstanding and a key component of a significant part of the tier as a result. Sadly, this role did not last into Oras. Power creep was immense, first of all, meaning Gujar no longer was able to stand up against the threats of the tier. Additionally, the bulky spikes heavy direction the metagame went in did not at all agree with Gujar's lack of longevity and minimal threat level against bulkier teams. Using Gujar in Oras was pretty much a waste of a slot, but that was okay, as that wouldn't undo its substantial place in XY. Even back in XY, though, the specificity of Gujar's niche meant it wasn't exactly topping OU's usage charts, and thus it dropped to Yuyu. There, it didn't really have much of an impact. It wasn't a bad Pokemon by any means, but it was unspectacular through and through. It was certainly serviceable, but whenever one used it, there was always the nagging feeling that one could be getting more out of its slot. Its hit-taking capability was solid, but it didn't really fill any particularly defensive gaps the metagame needed to be guarded against, and it struggled to not get outclassed in the role of a special tank by Snorlax. One of Lax's many advantages over Gujar was a neutrality to Draco meter, which was hugely important in fending off the tier-defining High Dragon, who was another issue of Gujar's. High Dragon was also bulky and had good typing defensively, but while doing this, it was monstrously dangerous offensively, far more than Gujar could hope to be. This started in XY and continued into and throughout Oras. Gujar was like a decent mishmash of High Dragon and Snorlax. Kind of, but actually decent enough to be used at the level of serious tournament play. Some players theorize a choice band set that could potentially differentiate it from High Dragon by virtue of surprise value and actually making use of Sap Sipper's plus one attack boost, but this too was just an inferior Snorlax. It's a shame Gudra never managed to drop to Aryu, as most players felt it should. It would have wrecked the tier most likely, but it'd be better than languishing in Yuyu as it wound up doing. Gudra's debut generation was a strange one, as it started off decent, but it couldn't sustain its niche over time and had its shortcomings exposed. Gujar brought its Assault Vest set to VGC 2014, where it was excellent for shrugging off the bevy of powerful special attackers populating the tier. Mega Charizard Y, Mega Gengar, Zapdos, and the like wore nothing to Gujar's nigh impenetrable special height, while even super effective Salamence Draco meters didn't necessarily strike fear in it at high health. While striking back effectively in return with its solid, powerful, colorful concoctions of coverage, able to adapt its movesets to its team's needs. It could even provide team support despite the attack only limitation of Assault Vest since its access to feint allowed it to break opposing protects for the benefits of its teammates, making them far more dangerous. Gudra's gooey ability, just about never seen in singles, also had solid potential application in VGC. A Pokemon using a move that made contact with Gudra would have its speed lowered. It was specific, but could be incredibly beneficial for Gudra's teammates. Of course, Sap Sipper was its primary ability in order to thwart Ferrothorn's ever-irritating Leech Seed. Gudra's brand of team support was incredibly useful and easy to slap on a team, so it got used a lot. So much so that we've had to limit its placements to those in the top 8. Alex Stamp and Alex Ogozola reached 1st and 2nd place respectively, using Gudra at the Oregon Regionals, which meant that both of them used Gudra against each other in the finals match. A trainer named Chris reached 4th with Gudra at the Adelaide Regionals in the Senior Division, while Thomas M reached 6th with it at the Brisbane Regionals in the Masters Division. Leos Kowaluski reached 5th at the German Nationals with Gudra, as he brought it in 5 of the 8 matches during the Swiss stage of the tournament, and a whopping 4 out of 5 times in top cut. He used feint on his Gudra, as breaking protect was immensely valuable to thwart any attempted stalling of the trick room his team relied on. At the US Nationals, Miranda Burroughs reached second with Gudra in the Junior Division, while Adib Alam also reached second in the Masters Division, enjoying how useful Gudra was at thwarting rain teams. Finally, Samir Sangwan reached sixth with Gudra at the Australian Nationals, and Nikhil reached seventh with it at the South African Nationals. However, the massive power creep of 2015's expanded Pokedex meant Gudra's niche was left pretty much entirely in the dust. Its defensive niche was replicated by other Pokemon, or especially combinations of Pokemon, as seen in the famous Chalk setup. Its only uses were Zach Dalton reaching 19th with it at the US Nationals, and Kim Doo Ki, who placed 60th with it at Worlds respectively. Entirely Eclipse, Gudra did not return for the 2016 metagame either. Nevertheless, its 2014 niche was as legit as they come. Gujra finally dropped to Aryu with the power creep of Generation 7 being undeniable to where nobody could delude themselves into thinking it was worthwhile in Yu Yu. Unfortunately, this came just a bit too late. Gujra wasn't bad in Gen 7 Aryu by any means. It was just, once again, 
unspectacular. It definitely at least had more of a niche than in the previous generations, Yu Yu, but that wasn't exactly a high bar. Still, Gujra had its moments, and those moments were definitely more interesting than before because players took a new approach with it. They decided to try and get the most of its solid power and amazing coverage by fixing its speed with Choice Scarf, suddenly able to blast through offensive Pokemon and otherwise lose to one on one. It went from being overwhelmed by the fast pace of such teams to being able to threaten them quite severely. Additionally, Gujra was far from beholden to only running Scarf. It could unleash some nasty choice specs Draco meters as well, taking advantage of the presence of popular grasses like Shaman and Roserade, which gave it plenty of opportunity to switch in and wreak destruction even against more offensive teams. While it became newly threatening as a wall breaker, finding opportunities effortlessly against weaker bulky Pokemon like Mandibuzz and Slowbro. Sadly, despite what it could do, Gujra remained generally unimpressive and not quite impactful based on what it did do. The Scarf set was decent against offense, but thanks to Gujra's low base speed, it had two significant problems that Scarfers generally were not supposed to have. One, it wasn't going to be outrunning sweepers that boosted their speed, like Barbaco or Zygarde 10%. But that would be forgivable if Gujra didn't also naturally get outsped by naturally fast Pokemon like Mega Sceptile, which was much more significant. And even this was pushed to the breaking point by the fact that Gujra didn't hit nearly hard enough to make up for this. It couldn't even reliably revenge kill the likes of Verizion, for example, leading players to ask what was the point of using Scarf Gudra? They didn't find a satisfactory answer, nor did they find one when the same question was posed for Specs Gudra. Upon realizing that it wasn't difficult to stop even for bulky teams, since their staples like Registeel and Milotic generally didn't have a problem taking it on. If you wanted an RU Dragon, you were better off with Flygon or Noivern, especially as a Scarfer. Sadly, Gudra once again didn't find its way to the tier below, where it would have been quite excellent, and instead languished in RU. Not bad enough to be terrible, but not really worth using if you seriously wanted to win either. Gujra and its trusty Assault Vest returned in Generation 7. Though its presence wasn't really felt, it was a bit on the bland side, as it didn't do much that was specifically unique or useful defensively. Sure, it took hits well, but not in any particularly standout way. That's not to say it couldn't be valuable. It absolutely did have that potential, as demonstrated in the small smattering of successful placements it had, and it was quite solid in helping its trainers reach those placements. It was just a bit limited in how it could fit on teams, which is why its uses started decently, but tapered off over the generation. We've kept its placements to top four. Arvin Roman reached fourth with it at the December 2016 San Jose Regionals. Tomoya Kimura won the 2017 Anaheim Open with it. Sandy Martinez reached fourth with it at the 2017 Daytona Beach Regionals. And Yoko Taguma reached second with it at the 2018 Auckland Special Event. These placements were quite good, but there wasn't much else. Still, you could do a lot worse. So Gujar had his own place, if on the small side, in Gen 7 VGC. Gujra returned to RU in Generation 8, but this time, everything fell into place for it, largely thanks to the reduced Pokedex. Early on, it was an absolute monster, even considered broken by some. Whether it was picking apart the metagame with precision through its widespread coverage, whose many super effective hits were boosted further by Expert Belt, or it was blasting through the tier with the raw power of Specs Draco Meter. It was very difficult to withstand Gujra, especially because Gujra got a ton of opportunities by walling common Pokemon like Ninetales or Salazzle. Its speed was good enough to let it get the jump on beware too. This meant Gujra was ripping through offensive teams as well as being nigh uncounterable for defense. There weren't very many good steel or fairy types in the tier, letting Gujra spam its powerful Draco meters with effortless aplomb. But even the few that were around, like Steel Silvali and Aromantis, weren't exactly safe from Gujra's assault, mortally fearing the likes of Fire Blast or Sludge Bomb respectively. The one Pokemon that could take Gujra's hits was Gigalith and its sand boosted special defense. And having only one Pokemon able to reliably answer a Pokemon with so many opportunities to wreak Havoc was bad enough, but then Gigalith got used so much in Yu that it rose to the tier through usage, and Gujra became even more terrifying. It could switch its approach up too. Assault Vest in particular made it monstrously tanky, providing more switching opportunity for both offense and defensive purposes, as well as making attempts to revenge kill it even more difficult. Life Orb cutting into Gujra's longevity wasn't ideal, but the power boost to Draco Meter, which wouldn't be Expert Belt boosted, alongside the ability to switch moves was huge. Gujra could even slap on Choice Band if it wanted though this was rare. It was just testament to how Gujra could pretty much do anything it wanted in early RU. It tore the metagame up. Then the Isle of Armor DLC came around and it knocked Gujra down a peg. Fortunately, this means it was quote unquote only very good as opposed to straddling the border of broken like it had before. It was similarly effective at getting on the field and threatening the opponent, but counterplay on both sides of the spectrum significantly expanded. Anything would have been an improvement from the near Nile it had been previously, but now RU wielded the likes of Bronzong, Gardevoir, 
Kaparaja, and Milotic, in addition to seeing the return of Gigalith, making taking Gujra on defensively a reasonable prospect, while the offensive pace of the tier also increased with Pokemon like Barraskewda, Tauros, and a Poltergeist wielding Golurk, making Gujra easier to pressure, as well as making its offensive onslaught less unique in its destructive potential. Make no mistake though, Gujra remained an excellent Pokemon for its combination of bulk and offensive power and coverage. Sadly, this didn't last in the Crown Tundra DLC. Power creep on both sides of the spectrum meant Gujra was no longer at all difficult to stop defensively or offensively. It was never going to break through the slew of solid bulky Pokemon populating the tier, from Milotic to Registeel to Reuniclus to Togekiss to Celebi to Umbreon, nor was it going to get too many opportunities against offensive teams with the faster pace and harder hits dished out by newcomers like Lucario and Mimikyu. There wasn't much reason to use it over Noivern or Flygon, and thus the player base didn't. But this allowed Gujra to, at long last, drop to NU, and there it shattered the tier with its expert belt set. It wasn't unreasonable to be able to threaten it offensively to an extent, but not to the point where you prevent it from coming in at all just by virtue of using staples like Rotomole and Salazzle. And once it was in, the tier had a dearth of reasonable responses. It too had killed pretty much everything the metagame could throw at it, even the tier's so-called most reliable answers. Sylveon and Vaporeon weren't much of a challenge for Gujra to bust through. The pressure it exerted in the team builder was ridiculous, as it was too difficult to build a decent team that didn't give Gujra plenty of opportunity to blast through everything around it. As a result, Gujra finally got banned from NU, capping off by far its most successful generation yet. Gujra was unspectacular to the point of basically being invisible in Gen 8 VGC. While it seemed fine, you could tend to do a lot better than fine in most cases, so players tended to look elsewhere, especially when quote-unquote fine tended to mean not actually very good in practice. Gujra really didn't do much of anything as reflected in its minimal usage. Yeah, it was decent against sun and rain, but it also didn't really do much in response to the opponent. At the 2020 Dallas Regionals, Aaron Perez and Becca Franklin reached 126 and 79 with it respectively, while at the 2020 Melbourne International, Jennifer Wilson and Bront Colmer reached 49th and 46th with it respectively. Nicole Saeed reached 20th with Gudra at the Malmo Regionals, and David Kodish reached 13th with it at the Players' Cup. Then Eden Bachelor reached 2nd with it at the 5th Hatterene Series. But Gudra still wasn't a Pokemon that left any real impact on the Gen 8 VGC landscape. Generation 9 saw Gujra return to NU and get banned again, pretty much immediately. The tier was severely lacking in decent steel and fairy types, and especially bulky neutral Pokemon like Umbreon and Muk, hefty as their special defense might be, still crumpled under the weight of repeated choice specs Draco meters. The tier gained Chansey bizarrely enough, but Chansey also suffered from the nerf to Softboil's PP, and was thus not a Pokemon you love slapping on a team, and could be outlasted as a result anyway. Plus, with terrestrialization around, Gujra became a particularly vicious threat. In fact, Gujra often tear it into steel or fairy type to take on opposing Gudra. Talk about minimal answers. As a result, Gudra was exiled to NUBL for thoroughly trouncing the tier. It's currently not a bad Pokemon in RU, but again, that whole Gudra thing where it's quite unspectacular. Still a second straight NU ban for crushing the tier, a far cry from Gudra's early days. Once again, Gudra doesn't have much presence in Gen 9 VGC, but it has had a couple placements so far. At the European Internationals, ONC used Gudra to reach 7th at the Junior Division while Lin Kun Wu reached 8 with it at the Tainan Regionals. Interestingly, it didn't use the classic Assault Vest Gudra, but opted for Choice Specs instead, and to strong results. It's not likely Gudra will make any serious waves in VGC, though with terrestrialization you never know, but it's likely it'll find its way to a handful of appearances again. And that's it, so how good was Gujra actually? Well, it's an interesting case, because it's got a lot of attributes that are very good, but when combined, don't necessarily add up to something particularly impactful. Gujra has historically been, for the most part, decent but unexceptional, with a lack of standout edge that makes it easy to overlook, especially when its in-battle performances aren't exactly stellar, and the niches it occupies aren't quite essential. Its debut generation started off with Promise, with its X and Y OU niche being quite an interesting one, but Power Creep from Oras took that away, and Gujra found itself large outclassing UU, and even worse, it didn't have low enough usage in the tier to fall to RU. Cruelly, it was the same story in Generation 7, except in RU this time. Fortunately, Gujra had its redemption in Generation 8. The limited Pokedex allowed it to shine in early and the Isle of Armor RU. Sadly, it lost this niche with the release of Crown Tundra, but happily, it finally dropped to NU, as it had wanted to for so long, and delivered the tier a resounding beating, getting itself banned to NUBL. And this repeated itself in Generation 9. Gujra had some deep 
decent VGC presence at first, but quickly faded to the background, generally being unimpressive, though not outright bad, which sums up much about its style and presence overall. So overall, Gudra has had mostly a quiet competitive career, but it's gotten better with the reduced Pokedex, and we look forward to how its Hisui form will perform with its upcoming release. Thanks for watching everyone, and thank you so much to the patrons for continued support of our videos and for voting for Gudra for this month's patron pick. And if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Gudra? How would you buff it? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And follow my career on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.